For more practice of the Fourier transform, let's try taking the transform of this signal x of t. This signal x of t is interesting because it has the property that it is odd. In the previous video, we took the Fourier transform of a signal that was even. This one is odd. These are both special cases, but there's still a lot to be learned from studying them. So let's go ahead and get started. We know that the formula is going to be a of omega. Remember, now that we're dealing with continuous, sorry, now that we're dealing with non-periodic, non-repeating signals, we no longer have discrete functions of frequency. Now we have continuous functions of frequency. So that's why it's not a sub n anymore. It's a of continuous frequency omega. So a of omega equals the integral from negative 1 to 0 of x of t, which is 1, e to the minus j omega t dt, plus the integral from 0 to 1. I beg your pardon, this should be minus 1. Uh, on the interval from negative 1 to 0. On the interval from 1 to 0, x of t is positive 1, e to the negative j omega t dt. So let's go ahead and do the math. So if we do the integral, we wind up with 1 over j omega times e to the minus j omega 0 minus e to the j omega 1 minus 1 over j omega e to the minus j omega 1 minus e to the minus j omega 0. Now, there's nothing wrong with stopping here. This is mathematically correct, and we could plug it into MATLAB uh, if we so desired to plot this function, but we can learn a lot by reducing it a little further. Before we go on, I'll just remind you uh, that there is a very handy trig identity that says that sine of theta equals e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta all over 2j. And if we exploit that trig identity, we can notice that this function here is really, oh, we're actually not ready to exploit that function yet. I beg your pardon. There's one more step that we have to do first. Equals 1 over j omega. Uh, so before I could exploit that trig identity, I need to factor out a term from both binomials. And the term I'm going to factor out over here is, see if I can get this right on the first try, it's going to be e to the j omega over 2. And if I factor that out, now here I should have e to the minus j omega over 2. And this should be minus e to the, uh, let's see, e to the j omega over 2. Good, I got it. So just to sanity check ourselves, e to the j omega over 2 times e to the negative j omega over 2 those exponents add and we get e to the negative j omega zero. And likewise, if we take e to the j omega over two times e to the j omega over two, those exponents add and we get e to the j omega. So I'm gonna do the same trick over here. It's gonna be minus one over j omega times e to the minus j omega over two. And what's left inside the binomial is e to the minus j omega over two minus e to the j omega over 2. Now the reason I did that is to exploit the sine function. So when I do that, I can see that this stuff inside the parentheses has to be minus 2j sine of omega over 2. And this has to be minus 2j sine of omega over 2. So this is going to simplify things a lot. Now I have an expression that's the sum of two terms, and those two terms have a lot of things in common that I can factor out. So we can write minus 2j sine of omega over 2 times 1 over j omega times, and now what's left from each term is e to the j omega over 2 minus e to the minus j omega over 2. Okay, so in other words, let's see, so we're running out of colors here. So this is the minus j omega over 2 term, and this is the minus e to the minus j omega over 2 term. And once again, we can apply our, tr we can apply our trig identity again and notice that this is 2j sine of omega over 2. 
So things are really simplifying nicely now. So putting it all together in the last step, uh, we'll have the, the, the two sine terms will multiply. The denominator will have a minus, will have a j omega in it. And we still have, there'll be a minus 2j times a 2j. So just to remind you how that math works, the twos will multiply together to give me a four. The j times j will multiply to give me a minus one, and that minus one will cancel the minus sign, so that'll all work out to be a four. So in other words, the final, final answer is gonna be four sine squared of omega over two all over j omega. Okay, and that's a nice compact answer. That's why we wanted to do a little bit of reduction on our original solution to the calculus is that we can get a much cleaner expression. Now right off the bat, there's something really interesting about this. Uh, if I, and I can make it a little bit clearer by rewriting this, if I multiply numerator and denominator by j, okay, so that doesn't change things, that just makes it, uh, just gonna just re-express this a little bit. I can rewrite my function as follows. I can say that a equals zero minus four sine squared of omega over two over omega times j. And the reason I wanna write it like this just for a moment is to really make the point that what we have here is a complex, not a complex number, but an imaginary number, okay? Some complex number, you can have real numbers, you can have imaginary numbers, or you can have complex numbers that have both components. In this case, what we have is purely imaginary, okay? Because there's no real component at all, okay? It's purely imaginary. And that is a consequence of the fact that the function that we were dealing with was purely odd, okay? In the example that we worked in the previous video, the signal that we worked with is purely even, and its Fourier transform worked out to be purely real. Okay, so those are two important properties of the Fourier transform. The other thing that we can notice is that if we go to plot the magnitude and the phase, we can expect, as a consequence of the fact that it's purely imaginary, that if you remember your, your complex number plane with reals and imaginaries, what we have here today in this example has zero real part and purely imaginary part, purely negative imaginary part. So we should expect that our phase angles, because they are negative imaginary numbers, the phase angle is gonna be minus pi over two. All right, so I've already gone ahead and created that plot for the Fourier transform. So this is a plot of the magnitude and the phase. And uh, it basically tells us what, what we expected, right? Here you can see the phase is minus pi over two. That's a little bit less than negative 1.5. And it's a constant, it doesn't change. And again, that's what we would expect for this signal. It's always gonna have the same phase angle. The other thing that's really interesting is if we look at the magnitude plot, you can see that at DC, remember DC is omega equals zero we can see that a of omega equals zero equals zero, okay? So in other words, there is uh, no DC offset. And that's just a function of the math, right? That's just, that's not something that, that, that I forced to happen. That's just, we did the math and that's what worked out. And that shouldn't surprise us. So if we look at the original signal uh, and we look to see what is the average value, we can tell just by inspection that the average value is zero, meaning that there is zero DC offset. Okay, so that thing that we can, we can intuit just by looking at it, remember this, oops, is, uh, the, is equal and opposite, this part here is equal and opposite to this part, so that's why there's no DC offset. So because there's no DC offset, we should therefore expect that omega, that the magnitude at omega equals zero is, is zero. So that's, that's a big check mark, right? That's something that, that well, should have happened. So the final thing I wanna do is I want to run an animation of, of this signal. So what you can see now is I'm recreating, I'm basically adding together all of the cosines and what you can see is that the little red dots on the magnitude and the phase plots show me 
where I'm at in terms of my cosine sum. So I'm going and I'm adding together all these cosines. And as I add together more and more cosines, the signal starts to look more and more like the x of t that we're trying to recreate. So I'll post this code along with the video so that you can play with it. But what I would draw your attention to that's really neat is that first of all, when the magnitude is, goes to zero, the signal doesn't change, which sort of makes sense. If the magnitude is zero, that means there's no cosines to add at that frequency. So let me, let me run that video again so I can... Um, so you see when there's a big amplitude, the signal changes a lot. And then when the signal has a, when A of omega is small, the signal doesn't change much at all. And then as you add higher and higher frequencies, you start to, to develop the sharper edges with more and more detail. So we're going to add higher and higher frequencies now. We're going to start to define the sharp edges a little bit more. And then finally, you'll notice that we're not, uh, we don't have a repeating signal, right? We're just adding together cosines. And even though cosines are repeating signals, somehow, because we've done our math properly, that the repeats just cancel each other out and what you're left with is exactly the signal that we want. And if we were willing to let this thing run to higher and higher frequencies than just 100 rads per second, we would get exactly the signal that we started with.